Uh, I just have to say that it is one of the greatest pleasures of owning a bookstore is being able to host one's friends and former colleagues who've written books. And when the friend or former colleague has written a truly terrific book, uh, the pleasure is that much greater. And such is the case with, with our guest and, and good friend tonight, Todd Purdom. He's here to talk about something wonderful, Rodgers and Hammerstein's Broadway Revolution. Now, selfishly, we like to think of PNP as Todd's natural habitat. Um, he's done events for both of your previous books, or one of your previous books? One of previous books, and then a couple other people's And books. other people, and Dee Dee has done uh, an event for her book here. Um, he's also a true consumer of books, which some of you may know. He has, uh, at last count, more than 2,000 of his own books in his house in Los Angeles, which he refuses to part with. Um, and here's the interesting thing. He can recite passages from most of them. Um, so uh, this leads me to the following conclusion, which is that you actually missed your true calling as a bookseller. <laughs> so anytime, you're welcome. You know, you're looking for a job for any reason. Uh, and I, you know, I know a lot of your friends and colleagues from various uh, different organizations and entities are here, and many of you, of course, know Todd for his political and diplomatic and cultural reporting at the, at the New York Times, uh, where he was uh, for nearly 20 years and today is contributing editor at Vanity Fair and senior writer at Politico. But I just have to say, as spoiled as we are by his political reporting, it is actually very refreshing that he's chosen a totally different topic for this latest book. Because at least for me, with Syria and Stormy and Russia and Michael Cohen and... I'm never going to put the word president attached to the word Trump, so I'm just going to say Trump. Um, taxing our brainwaves on a daily, if not hourly, basis. Uh, it really feels like good fortune to have a book right here that offers psychic relief, as well as great storytelling, elegant writing, and rich insight into a period of changing American social and cultural norms. <clears throat> the Washington Review, Post review last week said something wonderful was, well, pretty wonderful. According to the reviewer, uh, quote, something wonderful is thoroughly researched and briskly written, seamlessly blending a cogent narrative of the productions with cogent analyses of their effect on American culture. I'm sure Todd will tell you why he chose to write about the storied partnership of Oster Hammerstein and, is it Hammerstein or Hammerstein? I said Steen, I knew that was wrong. Hammerstein and Richard Rogers, and how their work together transformed a musical genre and a country in the midst of war. But you may be wondering what exactly a veteran political reporter knows about musical theater. Well, uh, in this case, pretty much everything. Um, and early on, thanks to parents who played uh, show tunes all the time, Todd developed a passion for the music of the great American songbook on Broadway. He never outgrew it. And anyone who has ever driven in a car with him knows that whether he's going cross country or to the grocery store, he will immediately turn the radio to Sirius XM's Seriously Sinatra or the Broadway Channel. He's also he did a little research with family members. <laughs> former reporter, what can I say? He's also living proof that a marriage can survive when one party, in this case his wife Dee Dee, has only albums from the post Beatles era, and the other party, Todd, has a collection that is strictly pre-1963. <laughs> uh, Todd has also ensured that, his, that subsequent generations appreciate the modern musical genre as much as he does. His daughter Kate is already fluent and encyclopedic on the subject and will be going to college in New York City in the fall, or as she puts it, quote, only two stops on the express train from 42nd Street. <laughs> we wish that Dee Dee and Kate and Stephen could be here tonight. The only other thing, frankly, that's missing is a piano. Um, if we had one in the store, I would definitely make Todd play a few of his favorite tunes. I know he can do it. Um, and also show off the scores he's collected dating back to the, the very era of Rodgers and Hammerstein. Piano or not, please welcome Todd Purden back to PNP. And, and Brad for having me here. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and there are a couple of other people in the room that I should quickly thank, too, because I, I want to make sure I don't forget. Two of them are Lee Satterfield and Patrick Steele, whose spare bedroom I used during the research of this book, because I had the bad luck to decide to do this when we moved to Los Angeles, and almost all of the relevant documents are at the Library of Congress or the New York Public Library at Lincoln Center, so I spent a lot of cross-country time. And the second pair of people I'd like to thank are Mark Eaton Horowitz and Caitlin Miller of the Library of Congress who are here tonight and have helped more than they could ever know uh, me find the gems uh, of their collection, which it was a joy to, to be in. I should say at the outset that one of the things interviewers have been asking me as I've been traveling around this week promoting the book is what's a political reporter like you doing writing this book? 
And the short answer is because I didn't really grow up wanting to be a political reporter. I think I probably grew up wanting to be the Broadway columnist for the New York Times. And when I got to the New York Times, everyone thought I should be a political reporter, and I was too afraid to ask for what I really wanted to do. But I suppose I was hooked from the first time I saw a professional touring company of a Broadway show, which was in 1968 in Chicago, and it was a production of MAME starring Celeste Holm, who'd been the original Edo Annie in Oklahoma. I, was, I had just turned eight years old and had just gotten my first pair of long pants. And of course, that's what happens to the boy in the show. He gets his first pair of long pants. And we were standing in the forecourt of the Schubert Theater, and I looked at the publicity photos, and I said to my parents, oh, no, it's in black and white? And they said, no, Todd, it's live in color with real people on the stage. And from uh, Open a New Window, which is the big uh, early number in the show, which features a nude model standing in an art class, I was hooked. And um, anyway, so I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted to have spent the past three and a half years working on the book. I didn't intend it to be an antidote to um, uh, the, the grimness of our current American culture, but it has proved to be that. And uh, I think if I just say a few titles, you'll understand why. Oh, what a beautiful morning. People will say we're in love. It might as well be spring. This was a real nice clam bake. <laughs> Some enchanted evening. There's nothing like a dame. Hello, young lovers. Shall we dance? Climb every mountain. The sound of music. Those titles, those songs, those stories are woven into the warp and woof of American life in a way that anybody who is in this room, I'm sure, and people who are younger than anyone who's here, and people who are much older than anyone who's here, won't need any explanation for. But even I was somewhat surprised to learn, as I did my research, the sheer reach and breadth and the extent of Rodgers and Hammerstein's dominance of mid-20th century, century popular culture in America. And I begin the book with an account of them at the, at the peak of their powers when they were producing an original television musical for CBS, Cinderella, starring Julie Andrews in 1957. And it was a one-time color broadcast, not preserved on videotape, which wasn't yet perfected. And it aired on the Sunday evening of March 31st, 1957, the 14th anniversary of the opening of Oklahoma. It displaced the Ed Sullivan Show. And it was seen by 107 million people at a time when the population of the country was 172 million people. John Cipher, who played the Prince Charming and later went on to fame as the police chief in Hill Street Blues, walked out of the studio in Upper Manhattan in the middle of the broadcast, and on this rainy Sunday evening, the streets were completely deserted. He said it was as if a neutron bomb had gone off and killed all the people but left the building standing. And he realized that was because everybody was inside watching the show. So when I set out to write this book, I really had three goals in mind. The first was to try to explain how Rodgers and Hammerstein made their art, how they did the work they did, how they created the songs and stories they did. The second was to explain that they were also hugely successful and very savvy businessmen who created a financial empire uh, unlike any that show business had really ever seen before. And they did that because they knew that the way to assure creative control over their work was to have financial control. They'd both worked in situations in Hollywood or on Broadway where the producers and the money men had the final say, and they wanted to be the people who had the final say. And finally, I wanted to explore their personal relationship, which I was somewhat um, surprised to learn, and ultimately I found it a poignant reality, that while they were extremely compatible professionally, they had a hugely successful commercial uh, partnership, they were personally respectful of each other, and they were always polite. Uh, they really didn't have a close, warm, personal friendship, and each died telling friends he wasn't sure that the other had really ever liked him. And how they made such beautiful music with that particular kind of static between them was also a fascinating element for me. And, and to realize that um, they had this totally unified front that they presented to the world, but underneath there were, there were tensions that were uh, building. So to start with the art, the first thing to say, I guess, is that their partnership came about effectively as a result of a midlife crisis for both of them. Oscar Hammerstein, who'd grown up in the theater, his father and grandfather and uncle were producers and empresarios, um, knew almost everything there was to know about the theater. He'd been a stage manager, he'd been a writer, he'd been a producer. And in the 1920s, he'd had huge success with Jerome Kern, most notably in, in writing Showboat, which was an adaptation of the Edna Ferber novel, 
which covers three generations in the life of a Mississippi riverboat family, and was really the first Broadway musical to attempt to have a serious plot, dealt with very serious social issues, intergenerational uh, family. But starting in 1932, Hammerstein had had 12 straight years of flops on Broadway and in London, and a miserable period in Hollywood, where he hated being a hack for hire whose songs might or might not appear in a movie and who would be paid. He said, I was being paid for words instead of gambling with them, and I didn't like that. Richard Rodgers had had 20 years of almost unbroken success, although he too had a miserable period in Hollywood. But his longtime and only partner, Lorenz Hart, by 1941 and 42, was falling victim to a hopeless, debilitating alcoholism. And he was unable and unwilling to continue to work. So uh, Richard Rodgers was looking for a new partner, and Oscar Hammerstein was looking for a second act in life. He wasn't sure what he was going to do because he, he worried at 46 that he might be all washed up. So it happened that Richard Rogers was approached by the Theater Guild, which was the most, produce, most prestigious theatrical organization in New York. It had brought Shaw and Ibsen to American audiences for the first time. But it was uh, on its uppers. It was in a financial state of disaster as 1942 rolled around. And it was looking for something that might be a surefire hit. So the organizers of the Theater Guild turned to an old chestnut in their trunk, a play from 1931 called Green Grow the Lilacs, which was a riveting story about which of two guys was going to take a girl to a party. <laughs> it, had, it had run for 64 performances on Broadway, and it starred Francho Tone as the cowboy and Lee Strasberg as the wily peddler who spiced up the action. But it had remained a kind of a popular uh, thing in the minds of Teresa Helburn, who was the co-head of the Theater Guild, and she thought that maybe if it were turned into a musical, uh, it could have a whole new lease on life and, more significantly, refill the Theater Guild's coffers and save it from disaster. So she turned to Richard Rogers, who turned to Oscar Hammerstein. And it happened that Hammerstein himself had recently reread the play and thought it might make a wonderful uh, musical. So they met over lunch in the Barbary Room of the Berkshire Hotel on Madison Avenue in Manhattan. And with nothing more than a handshake, they became 50-50 partners. And they started to work on this show. And the first words that Oscar Hammerstein wrote to, to give to Richard Rogers after a long discussion were, there's a bright golden haze on the meadow. And Richard Rogers later said, you'd have to be made of concrete not to spark to that. And those words came because Rogers and Hammerstein were trying to figure out how on earth to begin their musical, because it was a given that all musicals began with a big chorus of boys and girls dancing and distracting people who were latecomers and rustling their playbills as they settled in after their meal. <laughs> And you couldn't possibly open a musical comedy with some quiet scene of a woman churning butter on the stage and a cowboy singing in the wings. But that was how Green Grow the Lilacs had opened. And after many months of consideration, Rodgers and Hammerstein decided that their play should open in exactly the same way. And that's what they did. They had spent many weeks of consultation, partly at Rogers' country house in Connecticut. But unlike the cinematic version of how people think of songwriters around the piano working in the same room, they almost never worked in the same room. And 90% of the time, the words came first. Hammerstein worked mostly at his farm in uh, Doylestown, Pennsylvania, in Bucks County. Rogers either in Manhattan or his own country house in Connecticut. And each of them had worked precisely the opposite way with their previous collaborators. The Broadway tradition was to set words to music that had already been written. And in fact, that's the only way Richard Rogers could get Larry Hart to work was to give him a tune or, or be in the room with him while the tune was being written. But Oscar Hammerstein had always wanted to write the words first because he thought that that would give more meaning. It could be a better way to develop the character's thinking and feeling and to, and to move the plot along if the words came first. Around the time their collaboration began, Richard Rogers went back and took piano lessons because he thought he, his musical skills were not what they should be. So he studied with a renowned teacher in Manhattan who'd been one of George Gershwin's teachers. And I think the effect of having the words in front of him when he wrote the music really led Rogers to a kind of a deeper, richer expl exploration of emotional themes and character development. And it's, it's obvious that the songs were not uh, just written to be a hits, hit song in the show. They were written to develop the action of the play and to elucidate the innermost feelings and thoughts of the characters. They had opposite working methods. Hammerstein was painstaking. It would take him days or weeks to come up with a single lyric. Uh, Rogers was lightning fast, although he said his reputation for being so fast was somewhat overblown because he'd actually spent weeks thinking about what he was going to do because Oscar was taking such time to, <laughs> to write the lyrics. Hammerstein would say that um, 
he could have thrown a brick through the phone when he realized how quickly Rogers composed a tune. And Noel Coward, Rogers' rival and colleague, said that, well, Dick Rogers can pee a melody. But Rogers <laughs> resented this, and he once told Johnny Carson late in his life, you know, people think I just perspire these tunes. I don't. I, I sit for a long time, and I know what the scene in the show is going to be, and I know what the character is. I know what the voice part, probably the tempo. And so, all right, I rode Bally High in five minutes at lunch, but I'd been thinking about it for weeks. And uh, as a writer and reporter, I, I loved how both of them describe the creative process. Oscar Hammerstein has a wonderful passage in which he talks about, if you're a writer and you sit in front of a fireplace with your pipe and a Great Dane and feeling like you have all the things a writer should have, absolutely nothing will happen. <laughs> but if you go out and dig and push and work, then something will happen. Rogers has said, I don't believe in the notion of instant inspiration. I don't think you see a mountain and instantly reflect something about its beauty. But the mountain goes inside you, and five or 10 or 15 or 50 years later, when you need it, you can summon it up and something comes out. So I think that explains a lot about why their work has lasted so long and why the, the uh, emotional themes and content of their songs ha have been as rich as they were. The second aspect of their partnership that's worth talking about briefly is the business side of things. They decided from the very beginning that they wanted to own as much of their creative output as they possibly could. And to do that, they came up with something that was really radical at the time, and that was they created their own music publishing company. Up until then, the copyrights for popular songs had lodged with the publisher, and composers got royalties for public performance or sheet music sales or record sales, but they didn't own outright the titles of their work. In fact, Oscar Hammerstein wrote a wonderful letter to his oldest son, Bill, saying, how I wish I'd had these rights for the 25 years of work I've been doing up to now. And so they uh, partnered with Chaplin Company, which was the leading publisher of Broadway songs. And they went into a, a partnership in which uh, Chaplin would do the work of publishing the music and promoting it and selling it and so forth. But Rodgers and Hammerstein would own the copyright. And that was really the foundation of everything else. Because once they owned those materials, anyone who wanted to use them had to come to them. And they could not be used in ways they didn't approve of. And it was a tremendous um, boon to their exploitation of their own work. They also pioneered the recording of Broadway cast albums. And I know that there's probably some aficionado here who's going to say, no, the very first Broadway cast album was The Cradle Will Rock in 1938. But they were the ones who made it a mass affair. Decca Records signed a contract with them, made an album of songs from Oklahoma, which, as you know, was a brown paper albums full of 78 RPM records. And it was such a smash success that that became the practice of every other successful Broadway show from that day to this. The difference being that in the case of Oklahoma and their other shows, these records were the top 40 records of their day. And in fact, the uh, original cast album of The Sound of Music and the soundtrack album of the movie of The Sound of Music together were never off the charts from 1959 to something like 1967. And they sold more, far, far more than the Beatles or Elvis Presley ever sold. So that was the popular music of America of its day, and they were right there in the middle of it. By the time South Pacific came along, they were producing completely with partners their own shows. And they also came up with the idea, which had never been done before for anything other than a purely promotional reason, they would market uh, merchandising items tied into the show. So there were South Pacific hair permanents, because Mary Martin washed her hair in the show, <laughs> and scarves and bathrobes and silk ties and towels and on and on. And this proved to be they took a royalty for every item sold. It proved to be an extremely lucrative franchise. They, um, they also, in, South Pacific was such a monster box office hit that the city of New York threatened to close the Majestic Theater box office because there was so much scalping going on if the treasurer wouldn't open his books for examination. And souvenir dealers on Broadway printed fake ticket stubs so that people who hadn't been able to get into the show could leave them scattered on their coffee table as if they'd seen it, as if to, to impress the neighbors. So in, in that sense, it was like Hamilton today. It was absolutely the hottest ticket in the world. And uh, Richard Rogers and Oscar Hammerstein estimated that on any given night, when the Majestic Theater was packed, there were about uh, tickets worth $7,500 in face value, but $25,000 worth of tickets had actually been sold, and they didn't see you know, any of that scalping, of course. By the early 1950s, each guy was making more than a million dollars a year, or about $10 million in current dollars, and the, the buying power, of course, was much higher then. But they also, especially during the World War II years, were affected by the country's very high marginal tax rates of up to 80%. And Oscar Hammerstein wrote a wonderful letter again to his son, 
saying, uh, you know, he's having the best year of his life, but almost all of his income is going to build destroyers and battleships and pay for airplanes. And he doesn't begrudge it for a second because he, uh, he wants to, uh, you know, support the effort. The corollary of their own tremendous financial success was that they were awfully good businessmen and awfully stingy with their collaborators. Um, they both had a reputation of being totally tight. And uh, Agnes DeMille, the choreographer of Oklahoma, which you just saw with its pioneering dream ballet and so forth, was paid $450 for her work on the show. And then when the show got up and running, they agreed to give her a $50 a week supplement for keeping the cast fresh. And eventually, but only many years later, they gave her a one half of 1% royalty in all first class productions, which means Broadway and national company productions in the US and Canada. And she went to her grave really pretty resentful of this. All the same, she worked with them on three shows and was second to none in her admiration for their creative skills. A, a less appealing feature of, of the two of them was that Richard Rogers could also be a credit hog. And one of the pleasures for me of doing this book was discovering some of the more unsung collaborators in their, in their partnership. And the one that I sort of fell in love with is a woman named Trudy Rittman, who was a German-born classical pianist and arranger and uh, a vocal arranger. And she um, started to work with them on Carousel and stayed with them for most of their shows through The Sound of Music. She was a modest woman, extremely talented. She didn't take credit for herself. But in The King and I, for example, she really wrote almost entirely, there's a brief quotation of a couple of songs from the score, but she wrote the ballet, The Small House of Uncle Thomas, uh, almost 100%, and Richard Rogers signed the piece as if it were his own. In The Sound of Music, uh, in Do, Re, Mi, Richard Rogers wrote the tune, but the part that we all know as Do, Mi, Mi, Re, Fa, Fa, La, it, it was Trudy Rittman, Lock, Stock, and Barrel, who wrote that choral arrangement. So I was able to find her great niece who lives in London, and she shared with me some of her letters, and those are in the book, and I think they're now on their way to the, sorry, Mark, the New York Public Library, where the rest of her musical scores are. Um, anyway, it, it's a big business even today, and the families sold Rodgers and Hammerstein to a giant Dutch pension fund, Imachem, in 2009 for $225 million. And last summer, the organization sold it again to the Concord Music Group, which represents uh, Creedence Clearwater Revival, Paul Simon, and James Taylor's catalogs. And Rodgers and Hammerstein still throw off tens of millions of dollars a year in revenue, and there's no sign that it's diminishing. There's a revival of Carousel opening on Broadway in New York tomorrow night. <laughs> the final aspect of their partnership that I was interested in exploring was their personalities and their personal relationship. In many ways, they were very much alike. They'd both been born in the same swath of upper middle class Harlem in what was then a Jewish neighborhood, now overwhelmingly African-American neighborhood. They both grew up in the apartments of their maternal grandparents for reasons that are a little bit obscure in both cases. They both went to Columbia University where they worked on the varsity show, the annual spring musical comedy. They both were somewhat skeptical about nightlife. Hammerstein hated cocktail parties so much that he perfected the art of backing out of them so he could say that he'd been there but no one would notice he'd left. And Jerome <laughs> Kern called it the Hammerstein glide. They both suffered from depression, although Richard Rogers' was much more severe in, in the 1950s, requiring months of hospitalization. Um, they both married women named Dorothy, who were both interior designers, although they had wildly different tastes and styles and, and didn't get along very well with each other. Um, they were both very formal. They were both very careful. They were, they were very um, uh, people of their era in the sense of their communication with each other. Um, but it's interesting, the one documentary record of their collaboration that really survives is a series of letters they exchanged during the writing of Cinderella, in fact, because Hammerstein had gone, his wife was Tasmanian, and he'd gone to Australia for the 1956 Olympics. And they signed all the letters, love, but the tone of the letters is as if they'd just met. And it's very starchy. And Hammerstein is concerned about the music, and Rogers is concerned about the words. And Rogers later told an interview, if they ever had a disagreement, they solved it in the manner of Alphonse and Gaston, no, we'll do it your way. And in fact, they're each circling very warily around the other. And at the end of the day, each compromises and does what the other wants in the, in the case of this one particular song. Underneath the surface, though, their feelings were often hurt. I found some letters that were quite moving in which Oscar Hammerstein complained that he felt, even though he was seven years older and when they teamed up by far the more experienced uh, man, that he was often treated as a junior partner. And you notice his name comes second, even though alphabetically it would come first. Um, Richard Rogers, on the other hand, was hurt that the Hammersteins would sometimes plan vacations without telling him. Late in, late in his life, he found out they were going to Jamaica, and it really hurt his feelings. So 
the Hammersteins asked the Rogerses, but it was too late and the damage had been done. But the truth is they had such a success and they had armies of PR people working with them and lawyers and accountants that neither one of them ever wanted to rock the boat. They never wanted to upset the tremendous success they had. Robert Russell Bennett, um, who arranged most of the or did most of the orchestrations for their Broadway shows, said he'd seen them cry, but only with happiness in the first performance of South Pacific. Uh, they, they were not about to mess things up. I think the thing that I'd like to close with before taking your questions, and I'm, I'm delighted to do that, is just a little bit of a reflection about uh, how lasting their contributions have in fact been. And I'll turn to Agnes DeMille, who in addition to being a wonderful choreographer, was a beautiful writer. And when Richard Rogers died, she wrote his widow, Dorothy. His medium was his music, and that lasts. That is with us. His music will be with us for hundreds of years. Fresh, ebullient, persuasive, adorably rhythmic, incomparable. And when Oscar Hammerstein died, she wrote to his widow, Dorothy. What a heritage he left us. How bonny and wise, how darling and deft, how inescapable so many of his lyrics. Girls and boys are going to talk with his words, with his point of view, long hence, and may perhaps not be aware whom they quote. He will be in the air they breathe. So I think the only proof you need of that is they're woven as seamlessly into the fabric of American life as the Star Spangled Banner or Home on the Range. In Rogers and Hammerstein's prime, only the music of Gilbert and Sullivan and Stephen Foster had enjoyed a popular foothold that had endured as long as their own songs have today. When a gravely wounded army lieutenant named Bob Dole struggled to recuperate in World War II, the only song that gave him comfort was Jane Froman's recording of You'll Never Walk Alone from Carousel. More than 60 years later, when Barack Obama became the nation's first African-American president, the opera star Renee Fleming sang the same song at his inaugural concert, and it has become the favorite game day anthem of soccer fans worldwide, starting in Liverpool. As a young basketball standout at Princeton in the early 1960s, Bill Bradley psyched himself, uh, psyched himself up for every big game by playing Climb Every Mountain from The Sound of Music. <laughs> when grieving White House staffers arrived for Richard Nixon's resignation on the morning of August 9, 1974, they heard the Marine Band in the Grand Foyer playing songs from South Pacific. For a state visit by the Austrian president, Ronald Reagan's staff ordered the Marine Band to play Edelweiss because someone thought it was the Austrian national anthem. <laughs> When Maria Shriver married Arnold Schwarzenegger, she called the Rogers and Hammerstein office for permission to march down the aisle to the strains of how do you solve a problem like Maria. <laughs> and even today, visitors to Disneyland's Main Street USA hear the Surrey with a fringe on top, and everything's up to date in Kansas City coming from the hidden speakers in the park. Collectively, the team's two musicals won 34 Tony Awards, 15 Academy Awards, two Pulitzer Prizes, two Grammys, two Emmys, a record unmatched by any other songwriting team. Late in life, Dick and Oscar liked to play a game in which they imagined that Oklahoma had been a failure. And then we tell each other why it was a failure and how ridiculous we were to do what we did, as Rogers once explained. Indeed, nothing about their collaboration's success was foreordained. If they'd never so much as met, Rogers and Hammerstein each would be remembered today as signal figures in theatrical history. Together they achieved immortality. But no one could have known that on the long ago March evening when a handsome young cow hand loped onto a stage singing about the dawn. So I'd love to take your questions. Do you mind if I take off my jacket? I'm kind of... If you have questions, please, if you could uh, come to one of these microphones. I forgot to mention that we're also videotaping this, and you can tell your friends who aren't here that they can watch Todd on our YouTube channel. Um, and for those of you who haven't had a chance to purchase the book, we have plenty of copies, and Todd will sign afterwards. But yes, go ahead, sir. Hi. Well, as Laurie Hart's nephew, I've read countless uh, books, of course, about Rogers and books and articles and so forth. And uh, I just wanted to commend you because I think by it's a, the multiple narratives <laughs> that have been written uh, are sometimes contradictory and in, in about my uncle as well. And I think bringing your journalistic talents to this, you've gotten it just about right. And uh, I wanted to commend you for that. I'm really looking forward. To, I've gone through part of the book. And, and, and uh, uh, interestingly enough, because my uncle died before I was born, I grew up on Rogers and Hammerstein. <laughs> so the second show I ever saw in my life was The King and I. And, um, and then on and on from there. So thank you for that. My question really was 
has been really been answered because when I first saw Todd Purdom's book on Rodgers and Hammerstein, I thought, well, there must be two Todd Purdoms because the Todd Purdom I knew uh, was from the New York Times and Politico and wrote books about Iraq and the 1964 Civil Rights Act. But you, I think you've explained why, but uh, it, it's, uh, I'm, uh, I'm glad you did. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Hardin. Thank you for coming. And uh, you certainly favor your father and your uncle both. Uh, I think anyone would. Um, Short. The, um, I, I think we would say adorable. But um, <laughs> I, I, one of the things that was interesting to me when I did my civil rights book, and I'll just tell you this, um, I kept coming across the name Robert Kimball, who was a young lawyer and aide to John Lindsay when he was in the House of Representatives and working on the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And the only Robert Kimball I ever knew was the theater historian who edited the complete lyrics of Cole Porter and Irving Berlin. And, and, and lo and behold, well. it's the same person. And yep. so, I mean, we can contain multitudes, I guess, but it's, uh, it's been a, a pleasure for me to, to have a, a slight escape from my day job. And um, I, I do think one of the things that was... Uh, I knew this, but I learned even more about just how politically involved Oscar Hammerstein actually was. And the shows uh, that he wrote have a great deal of political content, uh, not just South Pacific, which is notable, of course, for Carefully Taught. But in the early 1950s, um, he had his passport uh, restricted. He could not get more than six months renewal at a time because somebody complained to the FBI that he was a security risk. And it was largely because he'd been very active in anti-fascist causes in Hollywood in the 1930s. And he contributed to the United Negro College Fund and the NAACP and various other organizations that were deemed suspect by the Attorney General. And the irony is that he, ha in order to have his passport fully restored, he had to write an affidavit attesting to his loyalty as an American. And the draft of that affidavit from November 1953 was written on the very day that he and Richard Rogers were presiding over a dinner for B'nai B'rith at the Mayflower Hotel presided over by President Eisenhower, who praised them to the skies as the leading examples of Americanism. And, um, and he, Oscar, was struggling to have the rights of every citizen for a full passport. So anyway, there, there, there is politics in the book as well. So, <laughs> Yes, sir. Uh, uh, these plays have been translated and performed all over the world. And I've, like probably some other members of the audience, have seen them in other languages. I'm wondering, although The Sound of Music is not known in Germany, it wasn't known in Austria for a long time either. It was, yeah. it was awkward. And The uh, King and I was banned in Thailand and it's been, yeah. you know. Uh, I'm wondering whether somebody like Oscar Hammerstein was particular about how these plays were translated because uh, not knowing the language that they're being translated into, how could you, how do they have, because I know the, the Roger Hammerstein organization is very particular about how these plays are produced. They're, so, tr they're tremendously particular. I think, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that I saw some um, uh, correspondence in Oscar's files about Swedish translations and other things. And as you're correct in saying, he didn't know all these languages. Well, I'm sure he had some smattering of German and he probably knew French pretty well. Uh, but certainly the organization today is completely diligent. One of the things that arose in the publication of this book was um, my publisher wanted, you know, it's the author's responsibility to clear the use of lyrics and materials like that in any book. And they wanted to have worldwide rights and they wanted to have rights in all languages. To which the Rogers and Hammerstein organization said, oh, "No, you know, you'll have, well, each one will have to be negotiated separately, and the Swedish translation would have to be approved by us, especially if you're quoting lyrics." And um, so, yes, I think one of the secrets of their success is they've been quite diligent that that there should be a certain very high level of professionalism, if not perfectionism, in in each production. And um, yes, you're totally correct in, in the that diligence. was true while they while oh, they were still very alive. much true while they were alive. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Hi. How are you? Uh, several years ago, Jim and I went up to New York to see a play, and we also went to see Shirley Jones at the Carlisle, the Cafe Carlisle. And uh, during her performance, she announced that for her money, uh, Meredith Wilson's Music Man was by far the best musical in the, in the world. <laughs> and I know you're from Iowa. Illinois, but close, close, oh, close, Illinois? close. Yeah, close. It's Oh. By a quibble. It's well, close I'm enough. Well, I'm from Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, of course, Meredith Wilson was from Mason exactly. City. And so, uh, well, that kind of spoils my little link up with Iowa. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. But anyway, and uh, she also told us that, that uh, for the movie, 
they wanted Frank Sinatra to play. Uh, they wanted him. They wanted him for the movie of Carousel to play Billy Bigelow, uh, in in the movie of Carousel. And what happened was they were trying to shoot it in two formats to make sure that they could both have it in um, CinemaScope and regular format in case anything went wrong. And the story that Shirley tells in her memoirs is that Frank Sinatra arrived in Booth Bay Harbor, Maine, gets out of his limousine, and tells the director, uh, "I sh I signed up for one movie, not two. And he turned right around and went back. But later, she said it was also because she was he was worried that Ava Gardner had threatened to have an affair if he didn't come home. So, um, but but it, it's thrilling to think what it, the original 20th Century Fox idea actually for the movie was to cast Frank Sinatra as Billy Bigelow and J Judy Garland as um, as Julie Jordan, and that might have been a pretty interesting pairing. So. Yes. Well, she did she did tell us that it was for Music Man they wanted him, and he said, and Meredith Wilson said, if you do it with him, I'm out. Yes, wow. I'm out. Huh. And if if you don't do it with Robert Preston, I'm out. So I, I don't know where the truth lies. Well, that's great. I mean, I'm sure it, the movie wouldn't have been nearly the same with anyone else as Robert Preston. Right. And, um, thank that's you. Great. No, not at all. Thank you. Shirley Jones was the only person that Roger Hammerstein ever put under a personal contract for seven years. She came from Smithton, Pennsylvania, and on her first day in New York, she went to an open audition, and Roger Hammerstein put her in the chorus of South Pacific, which was still running on Broadway. Then they sent her on tour with me and Juliet. But the idea that they'd always had in mind in the back of their pocket was to put her in the movie of Oklahoma, and that's just what happened. Yes, sir. Uh, in the Broadway productions, how much influence did the, the two composers exert over casting? Tremendous amount. I mean, they had veto power over the casting virtually, I would say. And once the Oklahoma and Carousel were both up and running, and touring companies began to go around the country, and they also had to find replacements for the shows on Broadway, they established this tradition of an open audition every Thursday morning. And the people they discovered through that process included Shirley Jones, Florence Henderson, Julie Andrews, um, there are some others. And it, it was basically known that if you showed up at the St. James Theater on Thursday morning, whoever you were, you could sing for Rodgers and Hammerstein and their representatives. And, uh, and, and that's, that became a, a staple of Broadway um, reality. Oh, sorry, sure. Thank you for that. It's great. I look forward to the book. Uh, you alluded to the, um, several times mentioned the enduring popularity of Rodgers and Hammerstein. But I worry, as I look around this room, I don't think there's anybody here in his or her 20s, 20s, maybe one. Good. Not too, congratulations. Um, not too many in their 30s or 40s or possibly even their 50s. So what, what are the numbers like? N n in, in a reference you'll all understand, no offense, Mayor. Uh, what, are, what, what are the numbers like? Are they still making lots of money? Yes, they are. And I would say our own teenage children, not just because of me. I mean, I, I got interested in this partly because I saw the joy that our children have in watching, you know, certainly the sound of music. But also, there was about t 10 years ago, a truly dreadful animated version of The King and I in which the king escapes in a balloon and so forth and so on. And and uh, our kids loved it. But I was in New York the other night with Ted Chapin, the head of the Roger Emerson organization. And he said he was once asked if what's the biggest mistake he'd had in his 37 years of stewardship of the organization. He said, well, it would have to be the animated version of The King and I. But um, so I, I do think that things like the new production on Broadway of Cinderella from from 2013, which is still touring all around the country. Um, I'm sure the demographic skews, you know, somewhat older, but I, I, I think there's also enough evidence that their music is penetrating into the world of younger people that uh, I suspect uh, it, it, it will have a healthy life. I hope now. so. <laughs> well, first, thank you all for that little introduction. <laughs> <laughs> What do you think Rodgers and Hammerstein would think about today's state of Broadway with the Lin-Manuel Mirandas and the Hamiltons and all the other new shows I'm not going to name because there's probably a new one popping up as I speak? I think they would be excited about the vibrancy of Broadway. I'm not sure they would love Escape to Margaritaville, but uh, <laughs> but 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 I think they would be very excited by Hamilton and the boundary pushing effort that Lin Manuel Miranda has made there to get people to think about. After all, I mean, you know, the book Hamilton is a doorstop of a serious biography of a founding father, and that's about as unlikely a topic for a Broadway musical as you know Oklahoma ever was. Um, so I think they'd probably be very proud and pleased that the envelope is being pushed. 
I, I didn't quote this in the book, but um, there, late in his life, Oscar Hermerson got a letter asking what he thought about rock and roll. And he, he said, uh, you know, I'm sure this is, a, this is a music that's coming and we don't know what will be coming next, but I look forward to what the next thing is that's coming. Um, uh, Richard Rogers later in his life wrote Burke Backrack a letter uh, when he had a success on Broadway with Promises, Promises, and said, you are opening a window and letting air in a room that has become in one way too noisy and another way too stuffy, and I'm proud of you. So I think one of the great appealing things about them is they were not snotty. They were very particular about how their own work was done, and they were very punctilious about it, but they weren't snobs. And the fact that they were willing to work in television when television was still a relatively new medium and all sorts of articles were being written that television was going to destroy the brain of teenagers and so forth, uh, they, they embraced the opportunity to write for television. And so I, I have to think that they would be, uh, you know, very appreciative of anybody who's, who's pushing boundaries and trying new things. Mark. <laughs> I'm just curious about your process what you regretted not being able to include in the book, just given space and, you know, what kind of hard decisions you had to make and what you wish you could have kept in. Well, some of them were made by an editor who's really, I should thank him too, Paul Golub at Henry Holton Company, who's a wonderful editor, but he did, he cut, I don't know, maybe 20,000 words out of the book and um, <laughs> uh, maybe not that much, but I, I think that... Um, <laughs> You know, there for me there are all sorts of little details that I that I wish I'd been able to get in there. But I have to acknowledge that um, it doesn't slow down the narrative not to have them. Um, people ask me what did I find that was new, and uh, what what do I have? And inevitably, they're very small things like these condolence letters from Agnes DeMille, for example, which I, I thought were very moving. Or I never knew, for example, that on the opening night of Oklahoma, I knew there were empty seats. I knew that the word of mouth was bad. I knew that people were not sure it was going to be a big hit. But I didn't know until I found a letter at, at the New York Public Library that among the audience members that night were Betty Comden, Adolph Green, and Judy Holliday, who had been dragged in off the street by a dancer friend of theirs who said, you know, there's this new show opening. Nobody knows what it's going to be. But, oh, there are empty seats, and here's some free tickets, so let's go. So that, to me, was one of those things of the kind of the great chain of being of the next generation of Broadway creators were there on the opening night of this important milestone show. Um, uh, I... I I, I I guess the biggest regret I have is that I didn't have more time and for research and to go even more deeply into, I think I did a pretty thorough job of looking at the Hammerstein collection. I wish I'd been able to go to New Haven and spend time with the Theater Guild collection. The other night when I was in New York, I realized there were some gems that they were projecting on a screen behind me from Agnes DeMille's diary that I didn't realize were there. So um, it's like every reporter, you have to call it quits at a certain point. Um, my late colleague, Michael Kelly of the New York Times, used to say, um, this story has the best of all possible qualities, doneness. <laughs> and, uh, and I, uh, but of course, the story of, of Roger Hammerstein is really never done. And um, anyway, I wish I had a better answer, but the, the short answer is everything. <clears throat> yes, sir. Uh, yes. Uh, well, first of all, this isn't really my question, but uh, you mentioned Edelweiss, and um, I got to interview Theodore Bickell yeah. a few months before his death, and, uh, and he told the story about how um, you know, Edelweiss was written for him, for those of you who didn't know, because he could play the guitar and, and, uh, and, you know, he was the, you know, he was the original, he, he was Captain Von Trapp, you know, despite Christopher Flora. I mean, he was, and in any case, um, you know, he tells a story about how, you know, people would come up to him after the show and said, oh, I love Edelweiss, but of course I only noted it in the original German. <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyway, my question really is, I, it occurs to me, um, I was thinking about Oklahoma. I was thinking about all these shows. I was thinking that actually my experience of them really is through having done them in high school or watching, you know, I, I, what I was really wondering was what their involvement was with licensing and promoting it being done in high schools and, uh, you know, in community theaters and that sort of thing. And whether it's, a, it's a good question because the papers are flooded with requests for that kind of thing. In the case of Oklahoma, they held out for a very long time. They had a successful national touring company. First of all, it ran on Broadway for about five years and, and a little bit more. But it, the touring company lasted for 10 years. And only then did they make the movie after they'd exhausted the appetite for the touring company. And then they would license it first to professional summer stock companies and only finally, much later, for amateur high school and things like that productions. There are some charming letters, though, in the Hammerstein Files where people like scout groups and so forth would write him asking for permission to do a truncated version of South Pacific or something. And there's one where he said something to the effect of, uh, my lawyer tells me I cannot give you this permission. <laughs> 
But if you do not tell anyone you asked, I will not tell anyone <laughs> that you can't do it. But I would appreciate if you don't say this to anybody else because it will get me in a lot of trouble. And you know, so, um, and then sometimes people who were running charity organizations or like at one point, I think the March of Dimes sent an awful version of You'll Never Walk Alone that they wanted to use as a fundraiser. And Oscar wrote back, why don't you just use the song? Which is in fact, you know... Um, <laughs> Uh, it had something to do with that when you walk through a storm with your pain racked bones and your, it was, you know, <laughs> and then some, somebody had a thing about, um, something getting to know you and they wanted to have some reference to a Siamese toothbrush, much youth brush. And, uh, so they had to fend off all that kind of stuff all the time. But th the answer is they were very, very careful about it. And they had, they had one, an another person who's kind of not known to the general public. They had an unbelievable lawyer named Howard Reinheimer who'd gone to Columbia with Oscar Hammerstein. And he was on the lookout for their interests at all times. And he set up their enterprises basically as a nesting set of interlocked corporations and limited partnerships so that they would always be taxed at the corporate rate and not at the then really high individual tax rate. And they could also take unlimited losses if the shows had ever failed. Uh, they could take write-offs as a corporation that they couldn't take as people. So the corporations had wonderful names like the Siam Corporation and Surrey Enterprises, <laughs> and um, and each one had its own letterhead. And anyway, but thank you. All right. Well, thank you. I hate to do this to you. Mike. I have actually two questions, and the first one has two parts. But it's about words. It's Washington. Word. That's okay. Yeah, <laughs> <we're>, <laughs> the first one's about words and music. And you said uh, 90% of the time with Rogers and Amberstein, the, the words came first. The words came first. So I wonder if you could give us an example or two of songs where the music came first. And then the second part of that is, do you know if in Showboat, when Hammerstein was working with Jerome Kern, did which came first? In Showboat, and, the music almost always came first. Okay. And then the second question I don't, is uh, about copyright. Just to clarify. I, my understanding, or Irving Berlin was notorious, I thought, for protecting copyright. So what exactly did, what was unique or new about the arrangement that Rogers and Hammerstein? Well, Irving Berlin had his own music publishing company too. So he was one of the rarities that, that uh, I'm not sure when he started it. He didn't start it from the very beginning of his career, but he was a pioneer in having his own. He was also a, a real stickler, as you say, for the use of his work. Our, our friend, the late Haynes Johnson, uh, made the mistake of quoting an Irving Berlin lyric in a book he wrote about the Clinton years in, in Washington. And the uh, Berlin had been dead for 12 or 15 years, but the Berlin estate came after him. And my understanding is it cost him thousands of dollars retroactively to fix it. Um, when Steven Spielberg approached Irving Berlin about using the song Always, uh, and Irving Berlin was uh, 97 or 98 years old, uh, he said, Steve, I've got other plans for it. I don't, I don't want to. <laughs> but... But in the case of uh, Roger Nemerstein, a couple of songs in which the music came first. The music came first for people will say we're in love. Uh, and Oscar wrote the words to that. Um, and some of the, the other great joy is finding, I, I have two teenage children and you try to tell them, you know, don't just stop with a first draft. So among the lines for people will say we're in love that didn't make the cut are, don't buy a hat for me, don't turn Democrat for me. <laughs> and... Uh, but the best one of all is in The Sound of Music when in the summer of 1959, I can just picture Oscar reading the New York Times about Hawaii statehood. And um, he wrote a lyric uh, for So Long Farewell that goes like this. So long, farewell, auf Wiedersehen, aloha. I hate to say the time has come to go, ha. And uh, it la no one can sing that song. Um, the, the other case in which the music came first was Edelweiss because Oscar was dying of cancer, dying of stomach cancer, and he'd missed the out-of-town triads in New Haven, and he arrived in Boston, where Theodore Bakel, who was a great amateur guitarist and folk, a professional guitarist and folk singer, uh, they felt Captain Von Trapp needed a song in the second act to round out his character. And uh, Rogers wrote a tune that he thought would be an appropriate sounding tune, and in the Ritz-Carlton Hotel, the last song he ever wrote, Oscar Hammerstein wrote the lyrics to Edelweiss, and he, here are some here are some draft lyrics of Edelweiss that also I, didn't make the cut. I hope he took more than five minutes to write them. He took more than five minutes, but he he was talking about um, he he did what he usually did. He made he made lists of um, words and thoughts and ideas. So the he wrote no hot house flower a toughie, not easily licked by weather storm wind or snow a tiny white flower that can mean so much all that is good in a great country. And one of the lines he wrote was, Edelweiss, Edelweiss, I'll come back and I'll find you, small and white, clean and bright, on the mountain behind you. And then 
almost certainly reflecting his own health. He knew he was going to die. Look to your lover and hold him tight while your health you're keeping. So um, it, it is the last lyric that he ever wrote, and um, uh, it was a pretty good one. Thank you guys very much. Thank you so much. I can't thank you enough.